Hey guys, the topic of this video today is to discuss why some Mazda Speed 3s will actually make more power than other Mazda Speed 3s with near identical bolt-ons. And so I have an example here for you where we have two vehicles, one on 93 octane and one on an E30 ethanol blend, where the vehicle on 93 octane is actually making more power than the vehicle that is running E30. And so we're going to actually sort through some data and uh, go through a bit of explanation as to why one is making more power than the other. So the first thing I'll do is I'll show you what both vehicles are making for power. So this here is vehicle 1 which has been tuned on an E30 ethanol blend. It is making 280 horsepower, 353 foot-pounds of torque. Now the first thing that I'm sure you're thinking is wow that horsepower figure seems awfully low. And it is a bit low, I'll agree with that. Now this vehicle is on E30 and we typically would expect a bit more power out of it, typically over 300 horsepower. However, this vehicle has been tuned and optimized and it is running to the best of its ability. It is a healthy running engine that shows no symptoms or any signs of issues. Then we have vehicle number two. This vehicle is on 93 octane, again with near identical modifications making 312 horsepower, 362 foot-pounds of torque. Now both vehicles have had these dyno tests performed on the same model and type of dyno, which is a DynoJet 224X, and both power figures have been corrected to SAE standards. Now the torque numbers are fairly close to each other, within 10 foot-pounds, but the horsepower on vehicle number two here is significantly higher about 32 horsepower higher. So first let's take a look at some data from vehicle number two. And let's just kind of get an idea as to what sort of boost pressure this vehicle is running. So you can see here by sifting through some of this data that vehicle number two is running a peak boost pressure of roughly 21 psi and in the higher RPMs near red line it is holding 18 psi of boost. Now let's take a look at vehicle number one which is the lower power making vehicle and let's take a look at what sort of boost pressures it's running. So vehicle number one is running roughly 21.5 psi for peak boost pressure and at that same 6500 RPM reference point we used before, vehicle number one is holding roughly 15 and a half PSI of boost. So vehicle number one is actually down about 2.5 PSI uh, compared to vehicle one. So now let's take a look at how boost is controlled on a OEM K04 and a Mazda Speed 3. So here we have OEM K04 and this here is the wastegate actuator and then we have the boost control solenoid. So let's now discuss about how boost is actually controlled with OEM K04. So let's start from the source here. We have the compressor cover and on this compressor cover is a nipple with a restrictor pill inside of it and the restrictor pill is actually there for proper operation of a two-port solenoid. Uh, with a three-port solenoid you would not use a restrictor pill. But besides the point, boost pressure that's created by the turbocharger enters the wastegate actuator and inside that wastegate actuator is a spring that is actually meant to hold the wastegate flapper door shut with a certain amount of force and when the boost pressure in this actuator fills up it actually begins to act as a force on the diaphragm and when the force exceeds the rating of the spring the wastegate actuator will then move in turn opening the flapper door on the exhaust side in the turbine housing and then will maintain boost that spring pressure. So over here you have the boost control solenoid and on the wastegate actuator we have a top port and this top port is plumbed to the inlet of the boost control solenoid and then the exit of the boost control solenoid recirculates back to 
the turbo inlet pipe. So this boost control solenoid is controlled by the ECU and it is controlled by the ECU sending it a pulse width modulated square wave that runs at 12 volts and a frequency of 20 hertz. So in the tuning world we refer to this as wastegate duty cycle or WGDC in abbreviated form. So what is wastegate duty cycle? Wastegate duty cycle is essentially the percentage to how hard the solenoid is being driven and that's in layman's terms. So let's take a look at what's actually happening electrically when the ECU is sending a pulse to that boost control solenoid. Now the Mazda Speed 3 ECU runs the boost control solenoid at a frequency of 20 Hertz. So at a 20 Hertz frequency the signal is being sent out at 20 cycles per second. So at a duty cycle of 0%, there is no single signal at all being applied to the boost control solenoid. So if the vehicle is running 0% duty cycle, what's going to happen is, is this boost control solenoid is not going to open, therefore not allowing any of the air that enters the actuator to actually re be recirced to the turbo inlet. So what ends up happening is, is that boost, boost pressure fills up in the wastegate actuator, opens the flapper door, and is then controlled mechanically to maintain uh, boost pressure at the rate for the spring. And uh, I believe on a KO4 that's somewhere between 10 to 12 psi. It, there are some differences between a couple years, but for the most part, it's roughly 10 to 12 psi. Now, at a duty cycle of 100% we would just have a constant 12 volts with no break in between. So if there was a constant 12 volts being applied to the boost control solenoid, what would happen is, is that this solenoid would be all the way open, never closing, and as much air as could possibly flow through this boost control solenoid will then be recirculated to the turbo inlet pipe. And when that happens, you have a significant decrease in the pressure inside of this actuator. And then what ends up happening is, is when that pressure ends up falling below the rating of the spring, the spring in the wastegate actuator will actually begin to attempt to close the wastegate and eventually creating as much boost as it possibly could. And then any duty cycle in between 0 and 100 is a modulated pulse, where at 50% duty cycle, the signal is applied at 12 volts for half the time in a 20 hertz frequency. So now let's go back and take a look at the data. And let's take a look at what sort of whiskey duty cycle is being run. So we're looking at the data log from vehicle number one and if we take a look here at wastegate duty which is in percentage we can see here that even at just 3500 rpm the duty cycle is already quite high it's already at 85 percent and it is taking this much wastegate duty cycle just to achieve that peak boost pressure of roughly 21 psi and by 4,600 RPM, we're actually at 100%. And so by 4,500 RPM, 4,600 RPM, the ECU is doing everything that it can to make as much, much boost pressure as this turbo possibly can. So from a tuning standpoint, there's nothing else that can be done for this KO4 to make any more boost pressure. And you can see here that it's just 100 all the way through even up at 6500 RPM. So at 6500 RPM we're holding roughly 15.5 PSI wastegate duty cycle is at 100 percent that means that the boost control solenoid is being driven as hard as it possibly can it is wide open and the spring in the wastegate is doing everything that it can to spin the turbo 
as fast as it possibly can to create as much boost pressure as it can in the system. So now let's take a look at vehicle number two. Vehicle number two, if we take a look at the wastegate duty, at 4500 RPM, we're only at 65% duty cycle, and we're holding that roughly 20.5 to 21 PSI peak boost pressure. Then at 6500 RPM, we're at essentially near 100%, and this turbo is maintaining 18 PSI at 6500 which is a significant amount of boost. And if you actually take a look at the mass airflow voltage, which correlates directly to airflow, on vehicle 2 it is significantly higher than vehicle 1. Vehicle 1 is only achieving about 4.2 volts from the MAF sensor, and vehicle number 2 is achieving 4.5 volts. Both cars have the same exact intakes and both both mass airflow sensors have been cleaned there's no issues there and both cars have no boost leaks both cars have been tested for boost leaks and there are none so what is this a sign of it's pretty clear cut and dry the turbo on vehicle one is weaker than the turbo on vehicle number two vehicle number two obviously has a turbo that is probably in better shape lower miles vehicle number one likely has more miles although I believe the mileage was very similar between the two but that's really what the what the scenario is here is that vehicle number one is not able to hold as much boost pressure in the higher RPMs where the 2.3 liter dizzy in the Mazda Speed 3 makes its peak power and it's as simple as that so let's say you're the owner of vehicle number one and you put your car on the dyno and you only make 280 horsepower and you're a little disappointed in why you're you know you're only making 280 and you you've seen that other cars have made over 300 maybe 310 320 in some cases and you're a bit you know confused and baffled as to why maybe go and show your buddy anybody tells you oh you know uh i know someone who's making a lot more power than that with uh the same mods as you, or less mods than you, and, and it, it's probably your tuner, or it's probably the tune, and you know you should probably uh, have that checked out. And in reality, we have a scenario here where I tune both vehicles to the best of my ability and to the best of the vehicle's ability, but one car is making more power than the other. This isn't a tuning situation. This is just a, a simple matter of where you have one turbo that is flowing more air than the other turbo. And this is very common to see with Mazda Speed vehicles. From the years of essentially 2006 all the way to 2013, you have a great amount of inconsistencies between both the engine and the turbo. You have some engines that just from the factory off the showroom floor, if you were to throw a compression tester on there and do a compression test, you would get, you know, let's say 180 or 190 PSI compression from the cylinder and then you have another vehicle that will might test at 210 or 215 and of course naturally the vehicle that has you know higher compression is going to make more horsepower and uh, although the pistons are are the same minus the difference between a gen 1 and a gen 2 piston the compression ratios are, are, are essentially identical um, some engines just for whatever reason are a bit tighter than the others and uh, this is really just has to do with inconsistencies at, at you know at the OEM level, and uh, same thing with the turbo. Uh, I've seen this scenario with vehicle one on several cars. It's not just uh, you know this one isolated case. I've seen it several times, and uh, seeing here that vehicle one is not able to hold as high as of a boost pressure as vehicle number two certainly doesn't mean that this turbo is blown or anything like that. In some cases it can mean that this turbo may be on its way out, it may be soon to fail, um, but I've seen vehicles that have essentially the same characteristics of a, of a weaker turbo, and their turbos don't smoke, they have no issues, no shaft play, and the turbos live quite a long life. So, 
if you see this on your own card, don't panic just yet because it doesn't necessarily mean that your vehicle, I'm sorry, your turbo is blown or your turbo may be on its way out. But it is important for you to understand how your engine's running, how your turbo's performing, and how it correlates to the horsepower and torque figures that you're seeing. So let's take back, let's take a look back at the dyno graph here. You can see here on vehicle number one, it's making roughly 353 foot-pounds of torque, and uh, that's around 4,000 RPM, between 3,500 and 4,000. And if we take a look at the data log from vehicle number one, we can see here that between 3,500 and 4,000 is when it is making the highest amount of boost pressure. And then if we take a look at vehicle number two, it's making 362 foot-pounds, which is only 9 foot-pounds higher than vehicle number one. However, vehicle number two is able to carry out that torque curve a lot further into the RPM range. And so, if we take a look at how horsepower is calculated, horsepower is equal to RPM times torque divided by 5252. And so we can actually see, by looking at the dyno graph from vehicle number two, we'll just do a quick, uh, a quick example here. At 5,497 RPM, the engine is producing 293.86 foot-pounds to the wheels. So, 293.869 multiplied by 5,497 RPM, divided by 5,252, is equal to 307.57 horsepower. And you can see that that exactly matches what the dyno has measured as horsepower to the wheels. And so if you take a look at this graph, let's say at 6,000 RPM, we'll use a reference point here. At 6,000 RPM, vehicle number two is maintaining 254 foot-pounds. But then if we look at vehicle number one, at 6,000 RPM, it is maintaining roughly maybe 225, 230 foot-pounds. And so since this vehicle is not able to keep the intake manifold filled with a, a higher boost pressure, as this engine sweeps through the RPM range, its ability to fill the cylinders with a denser air charge is inhibited. Whereas on vehicle number two, it is able to fill the cylinders with a much greater air charge, which then results in a higher horsepower. So, with that said, we have two vehicles here that both have identical mods. One is on 93 octane and the other is on an E30 blend. And both are vehicles that are tuned by the same calibrator, which is myself. Both have been tuned to the best of the vehicle's capabilities. There isn't anything necessarily wrong with vehicle one, and there's certainly nothing uh, vamped up with vehicle 2. It's just the nature of the condition of the mechanical components on vehicle 1 and vehicle number 2. Now on a OEM K04, the wastegate actuator is not adjustable. So there's really not much you can do to, let's say, add some preload to the wastegate in order to try to get it to hold a little bit more boost in that higher RPM. So, if you end up in this scenario where your peak horsepower figures aren't up to par with what most people see, it doesn't necessarily mean that your turbo's blown. However, it is probably a good sign that it may fail in the near future, or not. I've seen a scenario where the turbo doesn't fail ever, 
and uh, it just continues to run that way and that's that's the, the best that it can do um, with upgraded turbochargers you really don't see these uh, inconsistencies between units um, I know on the Mazda Speed 3 2010 was a very isolated year where the turbos were very weak they did not flow as much um, in 2009 there were a few cases where some of the turbos were very very strong you're seeing cars that were making 330 horsepower to the tires with just full bolt-ons or even with with some less mods you know making power that uh, some full bolt-on cars are making um, but when you upgrade to a aftermarket turbocharger they are produced with much more precision and uh, you really don't see these inconsistencies so whether it be let's say uh, a BNR drop-in turbo, Cork Sport drop-in turbo, um, an ATP Garrett drop-in turbo or a precision turbo um, those those aftermarket turbos will typically all make within the same horsepower of each other um, with the same mods on the same you know same car or uh, another car with the same modifications assuming that uh, you know you have all the supporting mods to go along with it um, now the the engine in vehicle number one is in perfect tip-top shape it has no issues the engine in vehicle number two also has no issues it's just purely a matter of one turbo being a bit stronger than the other and uh, after all the tuning has been complete vehicle number two just happens to be the stronger car so if you fall into this scenario like I said you may want to take a look at your data logs take a look at the wastegate duty cycle that is being applied to your boost control solenoid take a look at the boost pressure that is you know being able uh, to be held um, if it's not a vehicle that you're tuning yourself, then you know, then you speak with your calibrator and, and say, you know, well, how much boost am I supposed to be holding? And uh, you know, that ultimately comes down to um, how much horsepower you're going to be able to make. So, with all things being equal, uh, this is typically the comparison as to how you can kind of uh, identify the condition of your the turbo that's in your car and I'm just trying to think if there's anything else that I may have missed um, of course there are some differences between mods um, you know it does matter if you do have a top mount intercooler or a front mount intercooler um, top mount intercoolers you know will get heat soaked faster which will rob a little bit of power from you uh, after doing a few pulls um, depends if your downpipe is uh, catted or if it's catless for off-road use so all these all these things do uh, play a factor but with all things being equal and which is why I wanted to show this example because uh, both these vehicles have near identical mods and uh, we have a case where the, the vehicle on E30 was making significantly less power than the, the vehicle on 93 and so uh, this is essentially a situation where one is just stronger than the other and uh, has nothing to do with tuning doesn't really have anything to do with parts and so you may want to uh, you know think about your situation before you just go you know thinking that you have a problem that you're having a failure or if it's your tune or if it's the tuners fault or you know or one or the other and that's 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 typically the the most common uh, thing to attack you know, in the aftermarket world, and so uh, I made this video here to show you that, you know, that's not always the case, and uh, if you have any questions, feel free to uh, send me an email, give me a call, all my contact information is on my website, Facebook page, Instagram, YouTube, you can find me just about anywhere, and uh, I hope that this was informative, and um, please share this, I think that it is important for owners, or rather Mazda Speed owners, to understand, uh, you know, how their vehicle is running, and uh, you know, it's important for you guys as the owners to kind of educate yourselves and uh, get some insight as to how to identify how your car is running.
Alright guys, thanks for watching the video.